Thank you. You may be seated. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I'll be reading the entire chapter, including some verses that are not normally read at the Palm Sunday season, and you'll see why when we get to the message this morning. I'm going to be reading the entire chapter, verses 1 through 48. Luke 19, 1 through 48. God's word for his people. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he, He's gone in to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore it unto him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered unto them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to rule over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said unto him likewise, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, Behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest thou not my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? 
And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found, even as he had said unto them, and as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if they should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he had come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. But now, they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold their him, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him, and could not find what they might do. For all the people were very attentive unto him. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen.
Our missionary moment for today comes to us from Guatemala. Special prayer is needed for Caleb and Deborah Kang, for safety as Caleb drives a lot, and for Deborah's protruding right clavicle, which is very painful. They haven't found a doctor so far who's able to diagnose it. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your mercies and kindness to us, each and every one, day by day. We thank you that you are the God who hears our prayers and the God who answers our prayers. Father, we bring before you today this request that comes to us from the Kang family. We pray for safety for Caleb, who must drive a great deal. Pray that you'll keep him safe on the road, that you'll keep his car running well, that you'll keep it from mechanical difficulty, that you'll protect him from unsafe drivers, that you'll keep him awake at the wheel, that you'll help him to drive in a way that is pleasing to Christ and in obedience to the law. Father, we pray that you will give him your safety and your watch, care, and keeping and all those who travel with him. We pray also, Father, for your special mercies upon Deborah, for this protruding right clavicle that she has, which is very painful. Father, we pray that you will provide a doctor who is able to diagnose properly and appropriately what the problem really is. We pray that you'd relieve her from pain. We pray that you would heal her. We pray that you would strengthen her and give her the grace day by day to deal with the pain and the reasons for it that you have placed, for there is nothing in your plan that is outside of your will or that is not beneficial for us as believers. But we do pray, Father, for your healing upon her. Father, we pray for your mercies upon the family of William Leroy in their loss of him, a great brother in Christ, a great warrior for the faith, a man who stood firm for the word of God, faithfully for many years, faithfully dedicated to the service of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. And Father, we pray that you will encourage and comfort his family at this hour. We pray, Father, also for your special mercies on Janeth Hara. We pray that you will bring her safely through her stomach cancer operation this coming Tuesday. Father, we pray that you would heal her and raise her back up once again for the sake of her family, for the sake of her husband, for the ministry that you have given to her and Jonathan. Father, for the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, to those who do not believe when they see your healing hand at work in her life, we pray for your healing upon her. Father, we thank you that Sandy Walker is able to be with us today and that you are healing her from this persistent cough that she's had. We pray, Father, for Linda Bales, and we thank you that she's able to be with us today, and we pray that you will bring her safely through her upcoming eye surgery. Father, we pray for your special mercies on Reverend Gordon McGregor, who's recovering from a stroke even now in Delaware. We pray, Father, that you would heal him and raise him back up fully. We pray, Father, for your blessings on Rachel Whitbeck and Sarah Wren as they're leaving for a short-term mission trip to Jamaica this week, and for all the rest of their teams, both from King's Christian School and also from the church. We pray, Father, that you will watch over these young people, that you will keep them pure and safe, that you will help them to have a stellar testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you might fill them with your spirit and cause them to be obedient to your word. Make them unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cause them to share boldly the truth of the good news that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We pray for safety as they travel, safety while they are there, wisdom and safety for those who are leading these different groups. And Father, we pray that you bring them all safely home. Father, I pray for your blessings on Evangeline and Jorge today, that you would heal Evangeline from her anemia. We pray for Jorge that you would heal him from the tremendous problem that he has now uh, as they've discovered these mini strokes. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen him and raise him back up again. Father, we thank you that Maryland is here with us today also and is able to uh, be able to be over her bad cold and cough that she's had. Father, many have gone through sicknesses this winter. We thank you for this coming spring. And Father, we pray for those here who have unspoken requests, those who have various physical ailments, that you might heal them, that you might strengthen them, that you might give them the joy and the encouragement of knowing that you're the God who answers prayer. Father, we pray for our country. We are distressed as we look at what's going on, not merely in relation to the internal rottenness of our country in supporting sodomite marriage, but Father, we are even more distressed as we look and see how our leaders are treating the nation of Israel. We know that those who bless the Jews will be blessed, and those who curse the Jews will be cursed. And Father, our country is being set up for destruction even now. We pray for your mercies upon us, O Lord. 
We pray that you will turn the heart of our president, our vice president, our senators and representatives, our Supreme Court and all of our lower courts, our governor, lieutenant governor, our state house. Father, we pray that you will draw each of these people to Christ and all of our, our state uh, legislators, Father, all of our, our state judges, and Father, all those who work for them. We know that there are many even among the clerks for these judges who are researching the law and giving the judges the cases that they should use for making their final decisions. And Father, we pray that you will work in such a way that it will all be for the glory of Christ and for the good of your people, for the testimony of Christ in this lost world, and for the protection of our country. And Father, we pray for the protection of our troops as well, that you will bring those who are overseas safely home, that you will make those who are Christians among them bold in their faith, unwavering in their commitment to Christ, even in the face of those who would seek to silence them, even from high up in our own military command. Let them never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Father, we pray for us. There's a group of people who belong to you here in this place today, and it's by no mistake that you have brought us here. We pray, Father, that you will edify us by your word, that you will empower us by your Holy Spirit, that you will motivate us with zeal for serving Christ, that we might love him enough to tell other people about him. And so, Father, we commit this time to you. We pray that through it and in it, Jesus Christ, our great God and King, would be glorified and magnified. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our ushers are coming forward this morning to receive our morning gifts and offerings. We're once again reminded of the great truth of the gospel. The salvation is the free gift of God. It's not something that we earn. It's not something that you could earn. Not something you can buy. Certainly not by putting small pieces of paper and even smaller pieces of metal into a wooden basket. There's no way to get to heaven that way. God has made it very clear that sin is infinitely heinous. And God is infinitely holy. And that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, our gracious God and Savior, our Lord, our King, the one of whom we've just read, the one who fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, the one who died in our place and was buried, and who rose again from the dead on the third day. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this morning we are not asking for your money, and neither does God. I say that every week because we need to remember it. You cannot buy your way to heaven. If so, only rich people would get to heaven, and poor people would never make it. But there is not enough money in the entire universe to pay for the sins of one man, woman, boy, or girl. And besides, God owns it all anyway. So what do you have to give him that he has not given you first? So this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, we're not asking for your money, inviting you instead to receive a gift the gift of eternal life through faith in Christ alone. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the privilege of giving. It is a privilege that belongs to your children. It's not something that the church has to go begging the world for. It's that which you provide to us and then through us to spread the gospel of Christ. And so Father, we pray that as your people give today, that indeed it might be out of hearts filled with love, hearts filled with thanksgiving, hearts filled with praise, because you are the one who has given to us all that we are and all that we have. And so, Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> With his praises, one day when sin was as black as can be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my 
distance far away, rising he chose to find freely forever. One day he's coming, the glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved walks reigning. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, free me forever. Take your hymnals and turn to number 300, O oh, Glory, Laud, and Honor. Hymn number 300. and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And as you noted, I read the very long chapter, but all of it relates to the entrance of our Lord Jesus Christ into the city of Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday so long ago. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. All the children know about Zacchaeus. But the narrative of Zacchaeus is not included in Scripture merely to tell children that God loves little people. But that 
Jesus came to save sinners. It's not included so that children might know that Jesus might have lunch with you if you happen to climb a tree. <laughs> Isolated from its context, it does, however, give a clear picture of salvation for not only those who are lost, but also those who are despised by their own societies. God saves sinners. God saves the rottenest people in humanity. That's probably why he saved us if we are saved. It's best not to think too highly of ourselves. And the story of Zacchaeus clearly shows how material wealth is utterly insignificant trash in light of eternal salvation and the glory of yielding everything to Christ. I don't know if you noticed it, I'm not going to preach on it today, but as I read through the text today, it says that Zacchaeus, and he was very rich, and he gives it all back to God. And then we get to the end of the triumphal entry, and Jesus goes in to the temple and throws over the tables of the money changers and says, you've made my house a den of thieves. Well, there's a beautiful contrast there, and maybe some, some Palm Sunday, if the Lord tarries, we'll talk about that contrast. You have made my house a den of thieves. The story of Zacchaeus clearly shows how material wealth is utterly insignificant trash in light of eternal salvation and the glory of yielding everything to Christ. But in context, this story of Zacchaeus is a key transition for Jesus to make a future prophecy and to fulfill past prophecy in the present. The message today is entitled, The Two Comings of Christ to Jerusalem. And the text is that traditional passage in Luke chapter 19. But why historically has the church spoken of this Palm Sunday entry that led to the cross as a triumphal entry. This trip to Jerusalem ended in rejection, not a crown. In what sense was this a triumph or a glory? Conquering heroes ride horses and not donkeys. But Palm Sunday is only the first of two triumphal entries that refer to our Lord Jesus Christ. The first was when he rode into the city of Jerusalem on an ass, the foal of an ass. The second will be when he comes as a conquering king at the end of the tribulation. The prophecy about the first entry that Zechariah made 550 years earlier was fulfilled to the letter by our Lord. Did you get that? To the letter, literally. We can expect that the second triumphal entry will also be fulfilled literally and to the letter by our Lord. Zechariah writes of it five chapters later. Chapter 9, he writes of the first triumphal entry. Chapter 14, he writes of the second triumphal entry. If the first was fulfilled literally, who are we to say that the second would not be fulfilled literally? And yet there are people who say that today. Of that first entry, Zechariah wrote in chapter 9, verse 9, <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. That first official entry was indeed the entry of a king. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Even at his first coming, Christ was in fact a king. But the first coming was to be marked by three things. Number one, justice. It says he is just. Number two, salvation. It says, and having salvation. And number three, humility. It says he is lowly, riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Let's look briefly for a moment at those three things. The first entry, entrance fulfilled justice. That's very important for us because we're under the curse of the law. And justice deals with law. He had to fulfill the law. 
There was a deliberate fulfillment of the law at his first coming. Justice is the action of the law. Justice requires the payment of a penalty for crimes committed. In our case, the criminal offense is against a holy God. Justice is righteous. The just one is the righteous one. The king must fulfill the law and see that justice and righteousness are done. You see, it's not only his obligation, it's his character. At his first coming, Jesus bore the penalty of the law for us so that we would not have to suffer the judgment of the law. First coming, fulfillment of the law. In contrast, the second coming, the second triumphal entry will be not to fulfill the law, not to fulfill justice, but to execute justice against all those who have rejected Christ. Those who reject the fulfillment of the law must suffer the penalty of God's wrath upon sin. Second, there can be no salvation. The second mark of his first coming, remember, there was justice and then salvation. There can be no salvation if it is not in harmony with justice. I ran in recently to a, a young person uh, who was saying to me, um, well, I forgive you for that. The problem was they were the ones who were in sin. You see, forgiveness is extended to those who have committed sin. Forgiveness implies that there has been a sin on the part of the one who's being forgiven. That's bad theology when you say I forgive you to someone when you are the one who has sinned and the other person has rebuked you. No, forgiveness is extended to those who have sinned. The second thing to remember about forgiveness, and it's very important here as we look at what Christ is doing, is that forgiveness is only applicable to those who have repented of their sin. So for someone to say, I forgive you, when they are the ones who in fact have sinned and you have taken a stand against that sin, that's bad theology. Because it implies it's, it's shifting the burden, it's shifting the blame. It's modern psychology where we blame shift to somebody else for our own inadequacies, our own, well, can we use the word sins? We try to shift the blame to somebody else by forgiving them for being offended with us when we, in fact, have committed the offense. Here we find there can be no salvation if it's not in harmony with justice. We have sinned and offended the holiness of God. A penalty must be paid. The king himself came to pay the penalty and set his people free from the weight of the law that was looming over them. You see, if you're not a sinner under condemnation, you don't need salvation. Justice is what deals with the sin penalty first, the sin problem. Otherwise, salvation is an irrelevant issue. If you're not a sinner, you don't need a savior. But if you're a sinner, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, you desperately need a savior. Salvation, number two, deliverance was what Jesus would accomplish by fulfilling the just demands of the law. The wages of sin is death. Justice demanded it. The penalty had to be paid in full if we were to be saved from the wrath of God. The king came to see that justice was done so that we might receive salvation. Now let me contrast that with the second coming of Christ, his second triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. The first was for deliverance from sin. The second will also be for deliverance and for salvation, especially deliverance and salvation for the nation of Israel. Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, 26, that when the deliverer appears out of Zion, all Israel shall be saved. Not merely delivered, and we read about that in Zechariah 14, which we'll look at in a moment. But every Jew left alive on the face of the earth will trust in their Messiah at that point. All Israel shall be saved. The second triumphal entry will be for deliverance and salvation, especially deliverance and salvation for the nation of Israel. At that time, Israel will be helpless. Her military will have been crushed. The United States will have come under the judgment of God for forsaking Israel. Oh, people, 
if you're paying attention to what's happening in our country right now, I hope you tremble at the thought that this is what our current president is trying to do to the United States as he spits on Israel and kisses the Muslims. It's coming. Jerusalem will have fallen to the enemy. It will appear that all hope is lost. Satan and the enemies of God will gleefully proclaim a holiday. And then Jesus returns to deliver his people, his Jewish people, who have cried out for the Messiah to save them. Israel will have finally learned that she no longer is self-sufficient, self-sustaining, self-reliant. Her last desperate bloody grasp on human ability will have been ripped from her bleeding hands as she free falls off the face of the cliff in horrifying destruction. The Jewish brilliance, money, talents, resources, creativity, inventions, diligence, courage, determination, and their human war machine is no longer enough. With shock, the Jews will know that they have come to the end of their incredible history and they are about to be annihilated. At last, at last, they will know that only the covenant-keeping God of Israel, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, can save them. Amen. In desperate screams, they cry out in repentance for three days. And Christ returns to liberate Jerusalem. Listen to how the prophets proclaim it. Hosea chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. What is it they are weeping for? What is it they are crying out about? What is it they are suffering? Zechariah 14, I mentioned a moment ago. Zechariah 14 tells us, beginning in verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Remember, it's all nations. It's not merely Rome at this point. Zechariah is not prophesying the destruction in 70 AD. Zechariah is prophesying something else. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken and the house is rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth, and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. That's Revelation 19. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. That's the Mediterranean, the Dead Sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. That's the millennium, Revelation 20. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Down to verse 12, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. 
their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Folks, that has never happened yet. Is God telling us the truth or is he lying? The first triumphal entry was literally fulfilled precisely exactly to the letter as prophesied by Zechariah. Why should there be any question that the second triumphal entry will be fulfilled literally as well since it's also prophesied by Zechariah? The first time Jesus came into the city was on a donkey. The second time he will ride into the city on the stallion of the conqueror. That brings us to the undeniable contrast between the first triumphal entry and the second triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That brings us to that third thing that Zechariah prophesied in chapter 9, verse 9, about his humility. The third mark of his first coming was humility. That's the lowliness that Zechariah mentions. In fact, in that context, Zechariah emphasizes it. Because he goes on and doesn't just mention it, he talks about the, 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 the donkey, the, the cult of a donkey. The astounding thing about the first coming of the king into Jerusalem was that it was marked by humility. The Lord of heaven left pristine purity, beauty, holiness, and the splendor of heaven to enter into the squalid conditions of earth, taking on the woman-born body of one of his creatures sinful man. The way Zechariah emphasizes this humility is by stating clearly that Jesus would ride a donkey into Jerusalem, proving that the king was so humble that he would not come as a conqueror at his first appearing, but as the penalty bearer to satisfy the righteous demands of justice so that he could save wretched sinners, that's you and me, who deserved hell. That's in contrast to the second triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Christ, when he will ride the white stallion of the conquering hero, Revelation 19, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. At the first coming, the clothing of our Lord was stained with his own blood of sacrifice. His clothing at the second coming is stained, it says, with the blood of the grapes 
The blood of the grapes in Revelation symbolizes the wringing out, as it read here in Revelation 19, of the wine press of earth under the wrath of God. Here the blood of grapes speaks of the trampled blood of his enemies splattered upon his garments. The second time Jesus comes to Jerusalem, his garments are not stained with his own blood, but with the blood of his enemies. The second entry is not to offer spiritual salvation to the world, only judgment and wrath on those who have rejected his offer of salvation. This time his salvation is physically to deliver the Jewish people, to save every Jew left alive on the face of the earth, Romans 11:26, and to fulfill the promised millennial kingdom. He does not come in lowliness, he comes in intense glory. The second time, he does not come in humility on a donkey. He comes as a furious warrior king, ablaze with holy wrath against sinners. It's important to remember that we find the narrative of the triumphal entry fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy in all four of the Gospels. Have you thought about that? We find the triumphal entry in all four of the Gospels. There are only a few things in the life of Christ that are found in all four Gospels. You can compare them, lay them side by side. This has been done where you have a synopsis of all the different Gospels, one right after another, parallel to each other. And you'll find that Matthew has certain things, but Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't, maybe John has some of it. And then the same thing with each of those Gospels. They record different events in the life of Christ. John, in fact, says at the end of his Gospel, he says, I suppose that if everything was written down that Jesus ever do, did, it would fill all the books in the world. We only have a select few things that Jesus did because they were for a particular point. John tells us the reason for his gospel. He says, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's why John wrote the things he wrote. Each of the other gospels presents different aspects of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ to tell us about who he is and what he did. Only a few things in the life of Christ are found in all four Gospels. That makes this event highly significant because God has emphasized it four times plus the prophecy in Zechariah so that hopefully we'll sit up and pay attention. Even a half-witted, drunken, stoned, slothful, idiot college student knows that if the teacher covers something in detail four or five times in class, it will probably be on the exam. How many of you in school Learn that. <laughs> yes. If the teacher covers it four or five times in class, it'll be on the exam. God covered this in prophecy once and four times in the New Testament, every one of the Gospels. Do you think he wants us to know something about it? I think he does. Each of the Gospels contains the triumphal entry information that's not found in the other Gospels. The reason for this is that the gospel is emphasizing a different aspect of the person and work of Christ. For example, suppose that three people are watching a 4th of July fireworks display. How many of you have ever seen a 4th of July fireworks display? Come on, I want to see if everybody's awake. Okay, let's see those hands. I see that hand. Glad that all of you got saved today. All right. Uh, you've all seen a 4th of July fireworks display. Suppose that the three people watching it are a chemist, an eight-year-old boy, and a three-month-old baby. Each one will respond in a different way. The chemist is delighted because he knows which compounds are used to make the red colors, the white colors, the blue colors, the green colors, the gold, the silver, and all the other colors. He knows why some exhibits burst like stars. He knows why others look like they produce golden rain. He knows why others explode with the ferocity of a bomb. If he gave a report to his colleagues at the lab, you know what? I think it would be different than the report that the four year, uh, eight year old boy gives enthusiastically and happily as he describes that event to his classmates at school. For the baby, the event might have been sheer terror with explosions, sudden bright lights, screaming people, and intermittent dark. Those of you who've taken infants to firework display, as we used to do years ago with our little kids, Know that they wail in fear and have to be held close by their mother, which, by the way, increases the bond between the mother and the baby, just like our fear makes us cling closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But in the same way, the events reported by the Gospel writers have a different emphasis, even when they're reporting on the same exact events. For example, only Matthew and John cite Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 as the direct fulfillment of the prophecy. But all four Gospel writers mention the colt or the foal upon which Jesus rode. I'm just going to read a few verses out of John and Matthew and Mark so that you'll see the contrast. I wish we had time to read the entire passages. It's wonderful. I love to do that. But just to see some of the contrast. On the next day, this is John, when the people, much people, were coming to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Down to Matthew. When they drew nigh to Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say unto you, This shall you say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Over to Mark, they came nigh unto Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives. And he sent forth two disciples, and said unto them, Go your way to the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered in, you'll find a colt tied whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him to me. And they went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and into the temple. And when he had looked round about on all things, now the eventide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. Mark doesn't even mention overthrowing the money tab tables. So now let's go back to Luke for just a second and notice some of the very clear distinctives that Luke adds that we don't find in the other three triumphal entry narratives. First, Luke is the only one of the four gospel writers who mentions Zacchaeus. This should immediately strike us as a signal that he is key in Luke's purpose for recounting what happens at the triumphal entry. Perhaps we'll have time to discuss that in a future year. Second, Luke is the only one to include the following commentary, again for some other time. Verses 9 and 10, Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Third, and this is the key for today. Luke is the only writer to draw special attention to the second coming repeatedly in his narrative. All four Gospels make reference to the Messianic quotation from Psalm 118 and the cry of Hosanna, which means save us, but they don't have that additional commentary. For example, all the writers make similar comments such as, in John, they took branches of palm trees, went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Mark chapter 11, verse 9, and they went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. But only Luke mentions Jesus giving the parable of the pounds in connection with the entry. By the way, you should notice well that that's not the same thing as the parable of the talents, although that parable is also given shortly before the triumphal entry in Matthew chapter 25. It's also in a prophetic context. But the parable of the talents is not the same as the parable of the pounds. Notice here the specific prophetic things that are prophetic things that are stated about the second coming of Christ. Verse 11 is what introduces it. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. This is right before he enters Jerusalem on the donkey. He added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. There are two because clauses here. One relates to Jerusalem, one relates to the messianic kingdom. They're inseparably linked and Jesus addresses their misunderstandings of prophecy. In other words, what they thought about the way Christ would establish his kingdom was wrong. And he gave this parable to get their eschatology in order. Verse 12, 
He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Did you pay attention to the context? In context, the nobleman has already been in the country. And he has already appointed his servants to their task before he goes away and promises to return. Notice in verse 14, the next verse, there's a difference between the servants and the citizens of the country. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. That's the message that they're telegraphing to the one who is about to make the nobleman a king. About to coronate the nobleman. And they send it after he has gone away. They want to prevent the return of the nobleman by their hatred. I think it's also highly instructive to notice here in this text that when the nobleman returns, he deals first with his servants and only later deals with the citizens of the country. It's an important point of hermeneutics to always interpret parables by clear doctrinal teaching in the New Testament. But I think it's interesting to note that although the rapture is still a mystery at this point in the gospel narratives, this parable fits with what is later revealed to Paul that the rapture and the reward of the servants will happen before the Lord deals in judgment with the earth. Luke 5, 19, 15. And it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom. He receives the kingdom and then he returns. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money. He's given us some money too, hasn't he? That he might know how much every man had gained by trading. It's not merely to put it in the servant's pocket. It was the nobleman's money to start with, and they give it all back to him, including what was gained. 100%, not 10%, 100 Interesting thought. We all know how he deals beneficially with the faithful servants and how he deals severely with the unfaithful servant. But remember, there are originally ten servants in this parable, not three, like in the parable of the talents. There are ten servants in this parable, although he only deals with three of them. The others fall somewhere in between. We ask ourselves the question, where will you and I fall when this parable is applied to to us. This is right before the entry of the king into Jerusalem. The king is coming again. We look at the first entry, past tense. We are approaching the entry the second time. And we are the servants to whom the pound has been entrusted. He will deal with us first before he deals with the enemy. After the unfaithful servant is not only chastened by his Lord, notice he loses the reward that he would have received, and that reward is given to someone else. I think that's a foreshadowing of the judgment seat of Christ, which is not the same thing as the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ where believers appear, the great white throne judgment is where the unbelievers appear. But the judgment seat of Christ, of which Paul speaks, where all believers must give an account for the things which we've done in this body, whether good or bad, to receive a reward. To give an account for the resources that God has entrusted to our care. And then notice something else. After the Lord has dealt with his servants, then the Lord deals with his enemies. Verse 27, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Now, why all this on Palm Sunday? <clears throat> Do you get the point? You see, this is what Jesus emphasized immediately prior to the triumphal entry. They thought the kingdom was going to appear immediately. So he gives them the parable of the nobleman who is already there but is going away. The nobleman who will receive a kingdom and return. A nobleman who had servants and told his servants that they have to hang on until he returns. 
Oh, hang on. The servants have to hang on while surrounded by citizens who hate the king, who don't want the king to reign over them. That's us, folks. We are servants who've been called to hang on. We're servants surrounded by enemies of the king who don't want him to reign over us. That's what immediately precedes the triumphal entry. Look at the very next verse. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Only Matthew and Luke record Jesus overthrowing the tables of the money changers. But in that context, only Luke gives us the necessary chronological facts that help us understand how the entire Passion Week passed. This explains how the crucifixion was more likely on Wednesday rather than Friday. That's where we get that from Luke. This helps us understand the literal fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy about three days and three nights being in the tomb. Remember, the Jewish day begins at sundown, so Resurrection Sunday actually began on what we call Saturday evening, when the first star appeared. These few markers by Luke place the timing of the triumphal entry into the correct chronological framework. There were not a bunch of dead days of quiet outside of Jerusalem after the triumphal entry, where Jesus did nothing but hang out, as suggested by some. Each day was an increasing climactic teaching day irritating the Sanhedrin until they were literally bursting their seams with venom. That's what Luke says. Listen to it. Verses 45 and 46. He went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it the den of seas. Verse 47. And he taught daily in the temple. That's after the triumphal entry. That's after the cleansing of the temple. And then here's the venom. But the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. The venom is building all during this time, and they could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. They couldn't find him alone by himself any time to get him. Luke makes it clear that after Jesus cast out the money changers, Jesus came back and taught in the temple for several days before the crucifixion. All that time, tension is building. Fifth, Luke, who is the only gospel writer to include the birth narrative of the shepherds in the field. I hope you notice this as I read through it. I tried to emphasize it. Luke takes us back to the incarnation and the words of the angels in heaven as they announce the supernatural birth of the newborn king. Luke is the only gospel writer who gives us a flashback to the incarnation, which included eyewitness testimony as his narrative draws to a close. Did you hear that in verse 38? Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And what did the angel say in Luke 2.14? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I think it's fascinating to see these balances in the, in the Gospels. One of the hidden keys, I think, and one of the imprimaturs of inspiration. Sixth, Luke devotes a full four verses to the statement of Christ concerning the prophetic future. The prophetic future we just read in Zechariah about the second triumphal entry. Verse 41, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Remember, verses 37 and 38, they thought that this entry was going to bring peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench around about thee, compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and they shall lay thee even to the ground, and thy children within thee. Oh, do you pray for your children and grandchildren? And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. A fascinating word also occurs in Peter's writing where he talks about Christ's return in relation to us. Now there's a group out there called Preterists. They're heretics. They claim that all of that's already been fulfilled when the Roman general Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Not so. And for a very simple reason. Here's the answer. Their head in the sand ignores the rest of the prophecy of Zechariah, which we just read, about how God will defend Jerusalem and deliver it. There is coming another destruction, as prophesied by Zechariah, when Israel will repent as a nation and turn to the Messiah, and Paul prophesies it too. Israel did not repent as a nation in 70 AD. And so the event is not the fulfillment of the future prophecies of the second triumphal entry spoken of by Zechariah. The first entry was literal in humility. The second entry will also be literal 
but this time in power. Seventh and finally, at his second coming, Jesus is seen as the bridegroom, but the wedding feast of the Lamb is not yet in view. At his first coming, he has not yet been joined to his bride, the church. He is still calling out his bride, even as we speak. He has not yet come for his bride to catch her up to glory at the rapture. Plus, at his first coming, Jesus had no wife, no matter what the Mormons say. But at his second coming, he will have a bride made up of millions, truly a multiplied bride, who have trusted in him for salvation, offered at his first coming in humility. And then as the king, according to Deuteronomy, we studied that last year, he will sit on his throne with a copy of the law, judging righteously, and will keep the statutes of the Lord and execute them. The New Testament tells us that Christ will judge the world in perfect righteousness. Now let's pause for a moment just for a few final thoughts. When God tells us something once, we're responsible for listening and learning. When God tells us something two or three or four or five times, it's because he wants to make sure that we've heard and understood. The first triumphal entry is something he told us five times, once in prophecy, four times in fulfillment. The second coming of Christ is all over the Old Testament and all over the New Testament. Only Matthew and John mention the prophecy in Zechariah 9, but all four Gospels mention the animal upon which Jesus rode. Only Matthew mentions both the mother ass and the colt being loosed. Mark and Luke tell us that Jesus rode upon an untamed colt that had never been ridden before. Another proof, by the way, that Jesus is the Lord of all creation. It didn't resist his mounting. It didn't try to throw him off. But all four Gospels tell of the ride into the city. I hope you're seeing that there's an unfolding flower. There's so many questions and fascinating details about the triumphal entry. We've only scratched the surface today. For example, why does Matthew emphasize the withering of the fig tree before the triumphal entry? And Christ spent great prophetic detail on the fig tree in the Olivet Discourse. Why does Luke combine the teaching of Christ concerning the fig tree and the vine together, showing Israel's confusion over the first and second coming? We touched on those things last year. Why, as the king, would Jesus go into the temple rather than to the palace of either Herod or Pilate in Jerusalem? He's king. Why didn't he go there? Why would Jesus cast out money changers rather than pagan temporal rulers? Does that say something about our current 2015 focus on money and temporal things? Why does John mention the raising of Lazarus from the dead in connection with this entry into Jerusalem? Is that a foreshadowing of things to come at the second coming of Christ? Answer, yes. Why does Luke take pains to include the detail of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and prophesying its total destruction in the middle of his triumphal ride to the city? As I hope you've seen today, there's a lot more to the triumphal entry than we first realize when we read it only once a year. I hope God will move you to study that event with a more careful eye, with an open heart, and with exciting questions that will expand your faith more and more than you've ever had in the past. Because remember, oh, listen to this final thought. Remember, it won't be forever that God delays the Lord's return, having received a kingdom for himself. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this fantastic event in the narrative life of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews were looking for him at his first coming as though it were the second coming. And we today aren't looking for him at all. And yet, that return for his bride, the church, followed by the tribulation, followed by the, by the Lord himself descending from heaven on that great white stallion and the saints following behind on their horses to deliver Israel, to smite the nations with the rod of iron to establish himself as the king in fulfillment of his promises, literally fulfilled. Father, make us an observant people. Make us a people who are awake. Make us a people who are zealous for Christ in this last hour. Cause us to live lives of holiness and righteousness and purity, of obedience, of zeal, not the lackadaisical, half-hearted, 
mostly asleep, yawning type of lives that we currently live. Time is short. What are we doing? As those to whom our Lord has committed a pound and told, occupy till I come. What are we doing and what will we do when we stand before him to give an account? And what a multiplication. One pound turned to ten, multiplied into authority over ten cities. We have no concept of what immense rewards await those who are faithful. Make us, Father, a faithful people, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.